everybody and welcome to this week's bonus podcast where we are going to be doing a classic character profile for you today. I am Michael. I'm Gemma. And weather update, it's still hot. Why are you so it's still excited? hot in the UK? Can you calm down? I like it when it's hot. It's I know you, you do? I know you don't enjoy I'd rather it was like this, like if Incredible. I could pick for it to be like this all year round or, you know, freezing cold and snowy all year round, I'd go for this. You'd go for killing grandmas in their own houses and baking the, babies The winter kills grandmas as well. So we, do, we need eternal spring or autumn maybe for our, our octogenarian population maybe, I don't know. Uh, but I've got my shorts on again, feeling happy in the sun, but it is jolly hot, we'll see how we can get through the podcast. But I'm, I'm less tired than I was last week anyway. Um, and this week's counter Your profile... Shouting has attracted the cat. Cats come to come and sit so on my lap and warm me up some about? more. I, I, this week's this week's character profile. I, I can't believe I'm even saying this. This is a this is a momentous occasion. But this week, as our classic character profile, we will be talking about the one and only Alf Roberts. And the reason why I just can't believe this has ever happened is because this has been something that's been in the back of my mind that we've needed to do for at least six years. I'm gonna say. We're nearly at our tenth year anniversary for the podcast, aren't we? It's it's a mere month away, and. You know, when we first started the podcast, we did a character profile every week, didn't we? Yes, and you kept fretting. I kept fretting that we were going to run out of characters to do. Even after, like, our you know, second or third year of the podcast, thought we were going to run out of these eventually. And, and I was then, like, it doesn't matter, we just do something else. Well, yeah, and then we, then we started doing more interviews, we started doing the feature discussions and everything. But there were always some characters that were still left in the bag. And, and for me, the two biggies... Steve Fisher. We haven't done Steve Fisher yet, no. no. And we haven't done Audrey... No, what's her name? Audrey Fleming. Fleming. No, Audrey Fleming. Vicky and Audrey, no. But <laughs> the, the two in my head that were, and on my piece, well, you know, my note paper, electronic, that I, we needed to do were Mavis and Alf. And then a couple of years ago, we got round to doing Mavis finally at last, but Alf was always one that was like, oh, we'll do, we'll do it another time, we'll do it another time. And then it almost became like a bit of a challenge of how long can we go before we without doing a character profile on this incredibly major character, this really important person from the first 40 years of Coronation Street's history. And then it got a bit silly. And like, even, um, you know, when I put these up on YouTube and we have a little, you know, this is your life red book kind of cover mm -hmm, for it. Mm -hmm. And my template for that has got a picture of Alf on. Oh, so yeah, every does. week, every week, when I put a new Why one up on YouTube or whatever, Alf is there staring at me with a big smile. And I'm like, one day, going, Alfie, one day, we going, will profile you on this podcast. He's saying, I believe in you, Michael. I, you told me I'd be next. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry, Alfie. But now, almost 10 years after the podcast has started, finally, we've got round to you. And we can finally say after this one, we have done all the major characters. Now, I'm, there, there are still some characters currently in the show that we haven't profiled, some of the minor ones as well, and some of them I'm almost certain we will go back and revisit and do again and stuff like that because we've done a fairly bad job really, on really some of them. Do. Didn't we but do the Walkers as one? No, no, we did. We did the uh, we did the Ogdens as one. Yeah, that was um, unforgivable. I know, I know, it really, really was. Although, you know, like the Mallets, they were, you know, they did Yeah, I know, but I don't together, know what you, you think. You, on the one hand, you're like, we're going to run out of characters. And on the other hand, you're like, put, put, put Hilda and Stan together as one person. Well, also, um, back in the early days, the, the character profiles were about, what, 10 minutes long, maybe? And no. this <laughs> intro is going to be 10 minutes long with the way we're going. But anyway, I'm very excited to be talking about you Alf. Are, you seem very excited. I am. I, am. I, I, I do like Alf. And um, I mean, for you, I suppose, he was a fairly, you know, as elusive a character as so many of the others from the early days, wasn't he? Because you started watching Corrie in 2001 and he... Um, he shuffled off this mortal coil a couple of years before that, but you've been able to see what he was like back in his, his early days on the DVD rewatches, haven't you? I feel a particular kinship to him because I saw his um, portrait of his, him as the mayor when we went to the props oh, department. Yes. And I, I don't know why it struck me, <laughs> but I thought like, I, I felt like I was in a museum. Yes, this is the character who was a counsellor, he was a mayor, he was a grocer, and he was all things. Now, I thought you'd feel more kinship to Audrey and the Alpha and Audrey partnership, because one of the things that was such good, so good about their relationship was Audrey was the kind of the, the one that would be frittering, be careful, be careful. frittering the money away on um, fripperies and, you know, Michael. kind of... And Alf would be there kind of tightening the purse strings. So I think in many ways we're similar to Alf and Audrey. Well, I've been telling you all month, stop spending money on pictures. You spent over £100. I know. I'm de I am decorating the room that we're sitting in at the Do moment. Do you know that? Over £100. No, I, don't, I don't need to know that. Thank you. 
But um, yeah, Alf, Alf was great. I, d- I did really enjoy him and I was really excited when we went back to look at the old <laughs> episodes about what he was like in the past. So um, we're going to be going through the, the long and illustrious career of uh, Alfred Roberts. And um, so without further ado, yeah, Gemma, I'm going to pass over to you to run down his vital statistics. So we're talking about Alf Roberts. Do you know what his middle name was? Sydney. Alf, Alfred Sidney Roberts. Mm-hmm. You didn't think I'd know that, did you? No, I didn't. I, I only knew because I was reading about him the other day. Well, that's unsurprising. Named after his dad. Steak and Sydney pie. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, born on the 7th of October 1926 and he died on the 1st of January 1999. See, we could have held out until his 100th, 100th birthday, thinking. couldn't we? We could have just gone another four years. Um, he, he had parents, Sydney and Eileen Roberts and his brother Malcolm Roberts and he was married four three times one to Phyllis Plant in 1950 one to Reenie Bradshaw in 1978 and one to Audrey Potter in 1985 mm-hmm. uh, first appeared on the 8th of February 1961 and that might surprise a lot of people because I don't think Alf is remembered particularly as an original character no he's not but he was you know this was you know within two months of the show starting Alf was there but as we'll soon see he didn't get up to very much in the 60s and I remember us watching the 60s DVD going where's Alf where's Alf there he is and now he's off again but I do remember back when I started watching Coronation Street and uh, kind of doing a bit of research into the history and everything we're talking going back 20 years or so and the, the characters there over 20 years the characters that always stood out in my research as being, these are the ones who've been in it a bloody long time, were Ken, obviously, um, Emily, and Alf. And, th- and those are the ones that, as I was watching it at the time, in the late 90s, like, they have been in it right from the beginning. And then, obviously, Alf dropped off um, in the late 90s, 99, I think. I can't remember if it was 99. Yeah, it was 99. He died in 99, so he did well, drop off. Yes. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, he, he this, yeah. Very important character, but you're right, not necessarily remembered for his early days. Number of appearances, 1,778. He was, or is, as the time of us recording, the 29th most featured character. He was played by Brian Mosley. Yes. Now, Mosley was born in Leeds in 1931. And before um, going into acting, he was an air traffic controller in the RAF. That's incredible. I know, that I know. That is amazing. But you, you hear about this from some of the old actors. I mean, they're the old, a lot of the ones back in the day had to do these useful tasks in the war, didn't they? Somewhat. So they were all sold. I mean, we watched that um, William Roach documentary a couple of months ago, didn't we? Which had about him going back to his old, well, old army days. A lot of them then. were either in the forces or in the entertainment industry. Yeah, yeah, like um, uh, Bill well, Waddington, for example. Yeah, and Pat and, Phoenix um, was... Um, yeah, Jill Summers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he trained... He was in the RAF, and then he trained... Um, as an actor in the Esme Church Northern Theatre School. And this is in Very the famous. early 50s. <laughs> oh, I don't know. So as well as acting, now this is cool as well, he was also a stunt arranger. This is crazy. I know. Like, Alf, when I'm you think kidding. of him, you think... He, he was always a large man and he was a large boy and a large everything. But, um, yeah, I always think of him as being just just an old guy, like a, you know, the, the grocer, the mayor, the, the very portly, whatever. But he was a stunt arranger called Buddy Windrush. That was... That's, <laughs> n- that's just nonsense. That was his uh, stage name, I guess. And he's the founding member of the Society of British Fight Arrangers. Now, that sounds like somebody you just have down the, down the estate outside the shop. Yeah, so like, I've got more information about this later. It's basically oh, a case... No, yeah, I've got some stuff about it. But it's basically a case of because he was very into fencing and um when he did the stage plays and everything whenever there needed to be a sword fight in his theatre company and then you know this is then extended out into other local theatre companies he was the person to arrange the the sword fighting i know but when you say fight arranger it makes me sound like he kind of goes up to two people that are arguing and presents them with gloves (laughs) to slap each other around the cheek no what he does he goes up to one person he said see that guy that guy over there he just dissed your mum (laughs) said your mum was fat. <laughs> no, he's the one that said, I like this and I like that, but which one is better? There's only one way to find out. No, so he um, was started off, um, he directed the sword fight scenes in his theatre company's production of Othello and yeah, yeah, one thing led to another. He was and... obviously quite talented at it or perhaps yeah. enjoyed it and so they Maybe got a bit him of both. to do... More. More, yes. please. <laughs> so um, he started Coronation Street, like you said, in 1961, and he was just a recurring cast member for much of the 60s. So he had, you know, a handful of roles, a uh, handful of episodes every year. But while that was going on, he also had 
uh, built up his repertoire in numerous other shows in the 60s, including, but not only, Armchair Theatre, Z Cars. That that was what everyone was in Z Cars, weren't they? It seemed yeah. like it was the bill of the 60s. I don't, I don't even know what it was. I, I don't know either. We've had so many actors in Coronation Street. I need to find Z out Cars, what it was. In my mind, clue. it's either um, police training school for um, drivers mm. or it's a taxi company. I take. I think of it as being. What was that one with David Hasselhoff and the talking car? You know the one I mean. Yeah, I do know what you mean. I'm thinking it's like that, but probably not. Anyway. So it was that. He was in the Avengers. Zed was... cars, police, police. There um, we go. Procedural, set in Kirkby. Oh, there we go. Oh no, it's set in Newtown, but it's based on Kirkby. Yeah. He was also in Doctor Who a little bit as well, so that's quite cool for me. Um, he de- made his debut in Coronation Street in episode 18, and he was a colleague of Frank Barlow. Um, so Frank was Ken's dad, and as as the show went on, it was, you know, Alf and Ken you kind of associate more as being the, the elder gentleman of the street. But he, yeah, he was a mate of Ken's dad at the beginning, and they worked at the GPO, which was the post office. And I think his first scene was like in the sorting office of the post office or whatever, working with Frank. But his time on Coronation Street was very short-lived, because uh, if you know anything about Coronation Street history, you'll know that in November of 1961, um, that was when the equity strike happened. So everybody, or a lot of the actors just weren't, who were out of contract, had to go on strike. They weren't allowed to keep going. Um, and so that included Brian Molesley. Um, when the strike ended the following April, he came back to the show. But after this point, it really was just a handful of episodes here and there. Um, and he was actually trying to, he was actually thinking about trying out for a role in Hollywood when he was invited back to Coronation Street full time. And um, his proper, you know, um, IMA regular character now appearance was made 10 years to the day after his debut. And it's I'd like, did they plan that? Well, it, three years later, he was a regular character, but he uh, returned. Yeah, oh, sorry, that's right. Years. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. No, you're right. He was a he re- as a regular a couple of months after his ten year anniversary. But yeah, back in the show for you know, the the proper beginning of his next stint. Wow, well, ten years to the day, pretty of, cool. Of the lost Hollywood has to mourn. I know, I know. You think just of think. all those movies. He could have been James it? Bond. He could have been what's another old film. Um, Zed Cars the movie. <laughs> Zed Cars the movie. Uh. <laughs> the Bill the movie. Well, maybe he thought that he could um, use his, uh, you know, his contacts in the biz from his stunt arranging days to make well, Coronation have, Street the movie. Not necessarily have been, you know, a an actor maybe or leading man, but he certainly could have made his way in stunts. Mm, yeah, exactly. They had lots of stunts in the day. I heard this. <laughs> yeah, they used to like sword fighting for sure. They loved sword fighting back in the olden days. That's all they ever did, wasn't it? I think so. I can't think of anything else they got up to. <laughs> um, so, like um, many, I don't know, many, I'm making this up, Coronation Street actors, he made up a bit of a backstory. I know that some of them do character. this. I know some of them do. Yeah, like on, I remember speaking to um, Sandra Huggett, who played DS McKinnon, uh, and she, yeah. she said a little bit about the, the picture yes, that's that she right. created for her, for her I, police I really, officer. I really like that. I think I'd like to do that. I think it helps you. But then I'd be disappointed if they didn't use it in the show. And but it, it also shows a certain fondness for your character and a really, um, what's the word, I think admirable work ethic. Oh it does, it means that you really want to get under you the skin of this character, it, yeah. you care about them, you see your character as being almost a real person who's had these past experiences before the show and then your performance changes based on, you know, what's what's gone on in your head or what you've been told. Um, so... Uh, I, I yeah, don't, they never used his um, backstory. They, they, they? didn't. Uh, I, but I mean, like, Coropedia has got his backstory here, and I, I'm not sure whether this was the, the Brian Molesley created backstory or whether it was you know, a Darren Little creative thing. But anyway, Alf Roberts was born to Sydney and Eileen Roberts in 1926. Um, he looked up to his brother and um, his... Uh, what was that? I can't remember what he said. Brother Malcolm, did Malcolm. I say? Yeah, yeah, Malcolm. That. So he followed in his brother's footsteps and went to work in the post office. Um, he was a little bit too young to be able to do much in the Second World War, so he ended up joining it in like it was in the, the final couple of months. So we've already beat Hitler. What do you want? Yeah, I'll just you want whippersnapper. To help. No. He worked as a maintenance man in the Seventh Cheshire Regiment for a little while before being demobbed and then going back to the post office again. Well, he gets to go. Glass glory hunting, that's what I call that. <laughs> yeah, I helped in the war I too. I won the war. Um, yeah, it, was, I, it wasn't until I joined. It without me. <laughs> Once I joined, it turned the tide, I can tell you that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, now, I love this bit about his, his backstory. His parents insisted that he, ended, he went out with the end at courting 
um, the, his rich sister-in-law, one of his rich sisters-in-law. So Malcolm was going out with this Sounds one like girl a, with two Jane sisters. It totally does, doesn't it? And Alf had to go out with one of them. And um, according to this is a quote from Coropedia. I don't know where they got it from, but he arranged to take the least unattractive one out on a date to the theatre. So this was uh, this was Laura, but. <laughs> Sadly, he was involved in a car crash just hours before they were due to go out. And did he do that on purpose to get out of the date with so, the least unattractive sister? Who was sister? doing this? Um, Alf was. Alf. Yeah, he was. He was on. I don't know. He was on his way to the date or just having a drive around earlier that day. But he had to swerve to avoid hitting a child. Um, but Malcolm, his brother, was in the car and died. So this is this is kind of reminds me a little bit of the Toy and Imran situation that we're in at the moment. Somebody responsible whilst driving for the death of their loved one. It also reminds me. Not that I'm saying Toy was responsible. What happened to Rini? Oh, yeah, he's 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 not had so much luck with so car when accidents. He, when has he, Alf, like, has rushes he? rushes up and sees Rini dead in the car, he'd be like, "Not another one!" <laughs> Basically, so he he killed his brother, but Oops. a young child lived. So hey ho. Well, maybe that child grew up to be Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Alf ended up looking after um, Malcolm's widow, Phyllis. Uh, and after oh, his yeah. dad suggests it, he proposes to her. You said this earlier, didn't yeah. you? Um, <laughs> he doesn't actually fancy her or, or love her or anything, but he's just doing it because he is an honourable chap. And, so and that did. was the done thing in those days. So they got married in 1950. Second-hand wife. Yep. So um, Phyllis got to compare brothers, I guess. What a great name to you, Phyllis Plant. Yeah. Well, she was. She became Phyllis Roberts after that, didn't she? I think she was just desperate to marry anybody. Mm. But now she's called Pee Pee. No, think about, think it through. And then she she's was not called. That's what happened. She's like, I can't be yeah, doing with this. Now she's in PR. Right. <laughs> Her parents. They're like, Phyllis, you got you got to marry you out of this situation. We didn't think it through. Well, because she was so unattractive, or maybe there's another reason, I don't know, Phyllis never actually appeared in Coronation Street, but she was still alive for a good chunk of it. Yeah, but just she, off screen. it wasn't her that was unattractive, it was Laura. No, but she was the least unattractive, which kind of gives was... me the idea that... No, no, it wasn't Laura that was... Uh, it, Laura was well, probably Laura's the hottie. Laura was the nicest one. There was a third plant sister, and she she's was... Un, she's mm-hmm. nobody, talk, nobody talked about her. Yeah. Maybe, no, because Phyllis was already married to Malcolm, so Laura was the only Laura, and somebody else was the only one left. Oh yeah, then no, that's right. So, so maybe Phyllis was Phy- better than Laura. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah, Phyllis so was, was the like, good one. Phyllis you know was what? the beautiful one. I've landed on my feet here. Then it was Laura, <laughs> and then it was unnamed Whoever. other sister. I yeah, I'm not going to say it. That's right. So Alf, Alf hit the jackpot I don't want, here. I don't actually. want to smear a name for being an unlovely name. <laughs> maybe you did it on purpose, just so the guy crashed that car. He's like, oh, so well, now I've got to like, marry your hot wife. Nothing can go wrong here. Either kid, <laughs> hit the kid or I kill my brother. Yeah, so actually, win, win. just whatever she looked like, Phyllis never appeared in Coronation Street, but the problem was he never loved her. Aww. So for many, many years, he was in a loveless marriage. He basically just went into it as a young man and, 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 and stayed married to her well, for a good British 20 way. years or so, not really knowing what romance actually was. Well, that's what your so first marriage should be all but, about. But, and, and as this was perfectly acceptable in the old days, he basically just left her at home, running the household while he was out with his mates, with with Frank and so on. And perfectly acceptable Going to the Rovers and going to work and everything. Sounds good so to me. So this is where we're up to when Coronation Street starts. Gemma, I've, I've made a few notes here about the 60s, but yeah, it didn't really do much. What happened to Phyllis? Did we find you, out? We will find out okay. what happened to Phyllis. I'm, yeah. I'm really intrigued what happened what to Phyllis. What are you waiting to see? 1961 to 1963, um, he makes 36 appearances on the show as a friend of Frank's, who's mostly in the post office or in the Rovers, but he also gets to go to Blackpool with everybody, and he gets to go to the picnic in 1963. Yeah, so he must have been important enough to be invited along to there. Yeah, but in the day, there were about five people in the show. Yeah, also they went to Blackpool like twice a year or something, it seemed, didn't they? Oh, I mean, <laughs> why wouldn't you? 1967, he gets elected as local councillor, and then <gasps> he clashes with Ken, because Ken's such a lefty. Ken, best mate's boy. Ken takes part in an anti-Vietnam protest outside the town hall and then Ken ends up spending a week in jail. Yeah, so I saw a picture of uh, of this when I was doing some some research for it and it's got yeah, Ken on some steps somewhere and, and Alf there going, whoa, you can't do this. Don't be... We want to go to Vietnam. Mm. I think it was turning <laughs> Alf into a counsellor that kind of gave his character purpose. 
yeah. in a way because you know at the sorting office at the post office I suppose there's only so much mileage you well, can get well you can get some that. drama out of it can't you like oh no I've put the letter in the wrong cubby well, hole he still did stay at the post office for a while a little bit so there was a little bit of can you can you get oh, this no, letter Mrs. from me McGurdy's that I shouldn't have posted oh no Mrs McGurdy's been caught into the into the conveyor belt and she's mm. about to get munched what? <laughs> by the sorting machine oh yeah this was the post office sorting yeah. machine so in 1971 um, he, he gets into a bit of trouble because he finds out that the masonettes, you know, the ones yes. that went up the, the, the Valerie Barlow hairdryer masonettes opposite uh, the Rover side of the street, the they were going to get demolished and turned into a community centre. He tells Hooray. this to Ina and then word gets out. Why? Uh, that, and, and the residents don't like the idea of no. this. They don't want the masonette knocked down and a community centre put up. They're don't into want... community and Coronation Street. we want to talk street. to each other, we go to the pub. It was a, a bit of an eyesore to be fair, what got built, doesn't it, for the community centre, a big, big blocky grey building. Yeah. Um, but anyway, he and Len have to deal with the protesters there. Now, Ina, at this point, though, no, nobody knows that it was Alf that, that gave away these council secrets. So <laughs> Ina says, right, I'm going to tell everybody that it was you that blabbed about this, unless, unless. you give me the job of caretaker She's at the community centre. Good Christian woman. I know she when she saw something that she wanted, she just she knew how to get it, didn't yep. she? Because because she felt that she was doing the Lord's work. The, God wanted to her to be caretaker at the community centre. Yeah. But she just needed Elf to give her give it a little facilitate it. Give give fate a bit of a push. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, somebody else ends up getting the job because Elf doesn't have enough sway in the decision. So Ina ends up scaring this other woman into thinking the area is full of like yobbos and vandals and everything. She's not wrong. She's not. She should have said, "Well, I've looked into my crystal." the ball and if you come back here in 50 years time you know tram crashes on the street drugs yeah. shooting crime city crime People central of manchester exactly but anyway she says it's a it's a very dodgy area so this first first woman who gets a job says no thank you very much ina gets into the job um now she became uh, sorry he then became quite close with maggie clegg who is also in an unhappy marriage because she was married to les clegg i think it was he was the drunken uh, shop owner you remember that Le one Clegg. yes Leg Clegg. and um so they kind of start to get a bit friendly there um, and if oh, no i'm not going to say that no, I will. If you've been watching the Bugger Nation Street things on YouTube, you'll get an idea just how friendly <laughs> Maggie and Alf were in some fans' heads. Anyway, um, yeah, so he, he's very friendly with Maggie Clegg after he paints her ceiling. Um, although nothing happens between them at first, obviously, because he's still married to Phyllis. What happens? You I'll tell, tell me. You. All right, I'll tell you. In 1972, she dies. That's what happens. Of cancer. You wanted to know, didn't you? Cancer. That was anticlimactic. I Sorry, it wasn't. It wasn't a um, you know, hit by a swerving car or anything. No. He's grieving. He feels guilty. Mm. I, I feel. I feel bad for her that she. She had, was a, a, a spouse of a very important character had a big dramatic um disease that these days you know would be on You'd the get front at least cover six of six months out of that. Yeah, you would. You'd be on the front of the magazine. Then you might even be up for a BSA. And you get she, to sit she one didn't in bed. even get to appear on the show. No. Nope. You, know, you had a lot to fit in those two episodes a week back in the day. Yeah, exactly. Maggie refuses to have a collection box Cow. for her in the shop because she believes that she and Alf have done nothing wrong. Mm. I um I think she protests too much. Me too. Yeah, by the end of the year, Alf and Len are both in the running to become the independent mayor of Weatherfield. That makes it sound like that there, there's a chessboard where you can move anywhere. <laughs> like, if you've got the independent mayor piece, mm. you're probably going to win. Yeah. So um, they want to be the mayor of Weatherfield, but Len loses favour when Rita, who he's married to... Um, no, is it, they're just seeing each other at this point. Well, she she gets into a fight at the opening night of the Capricorn Club, and for some reason this reflects poorly on him. I guess this is sort of like a whole Maria and Gary situation. Yeah. So I'm surprised that Rita didn't come up to to Maria and uh, oh, oh no to Gary same. and say, "Look, I know what it's like to get yourself into a bit of a scrap and ruin your partner's political career." <laughs> <laughs> Believe you me, I've been there. I've been there. Do you remember that episode where I do, she actually. gets into a bit of a brawl with yes, a woman? Yes, I do. She was a, she was a feisty one she, back in her day, wasn't she? She's another one that uh, because Rita started a little bit later than Alf and Emily and Ken. She was always one that I never thought as being. She's been never quite as long. She really has. What was nineteen sixty five or something? I know, Rita came even, into it. Says so she's been in that a really long but, time. But stupidly, even me, I'm like, oh, Hilda and Stan are new characters. What? I do. I think of you've them got as this new... wrong in your head just because we've no. watched them recently. 
No, I think of them as being new because they weren't into. In oh, the I see, I see. Yeah, I don't they, mean they new now. They weren't I mean, the OGs. Like, it's like they, yeah, they they're new characters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just before we go any further, Gemma, I need to correct you on oh. the pronunciation or something here. Um, is it is it not is it Watherfield? <laughs> I've been saying it wrong. It's not. Um, when we were referring to Alf Roberts and his um, lead Roberts. position. As, a, as the, the leading oh, chain I, wearer I of Weatherfield. I can see where this is going. Um, I, th- I think you'll find it is pronounced Murr. It's the Murr of Weatherfield. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where Murr came from. The gold frankincense and Murr. He got a gold chain. I don't just know what the frankincense is. Just have there. Just deal it's with it. I think it's just Alf. I don't think I've seen any other character Audrey pronounce it. Does she? We're going to have to do a survey. Gonna, do, but can I just say... I'm going to stand outside the curry gates and say, how do you... What do you what's call this? the person who works at the town hall? Clark. Well, Sally was never the mur, was she? I think you might be surprised. But if you, if you watch out, he was a definite mur anyway. Listen, what? they can't even get characters' names consistent on Coronation Street now. Whose name was it the other day that they got wrong? I don't know. They, it's not. It's not like getting it wrong. It's like that too. Oh, somebody spe- somebody said Evelyn the other day. Yes, that's right. Can that's we Pim please says not? Evelyn, I think. Can we? We have to have one agreed on way of saying everyone's name because it's Ardy or Addy, Evelyn or Evelyn, yeah. Yasmin or Yasmin. Yeah. We need. We need clarity. It's driving it's not, me nuts. It's not an accent thing, is it? Some of them are, and some of them aren't. Yeah. I think most of the ones we just said aren't, though. No, I don't think so. Is it, 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 this is a big debate, you know, in video game circles. Like, is it Mario or is it Mario? And that, or is it is Mario just a re- Bros? That is just a regional thing. But anyway, we digress. So, Murr it is. So, Alf gets chosen to be Murr in 1973 <laughs> with Len as his deputy. Maggie does not want to be the mayoress, however. So the <laughs> mayoress, sorry, I, I can't even be consistent with myself. Yeah, exactly. So he has to accept Annie uh, as the mayoress, and she's you know, very, very heavily hinting, which is very is right up her street, Love isn't her. it? You know, the the leading social uh, position in Corona- or in the whole well, of Weatherfield. She feels she's owed it. It's all the do's that she'd get to go along to, all the nice coats and hats. I thought you were going to say all the do's, all the don'ts. She'd well, be right on top of that. She would, she would. Now Brian Mosley of, of, of this appointment, I don't know when he said this, but I've got a quote from him, and he said that Harry. Harry Kershaw said that the intention was to show people how Murs operated, you know, where they got their suits from, all that kind of stuff. But this was deemed not to be part of Coronation Street, so it was never actually shown. All we ever saw him do was go off looking posh, but it didn't tell you anything as to how the mayoral- mayorality mayorality no, <laughs> functioned, which was a missed opportunity, I think. I so absolutely agree with that. It wasn't too different for Sally, to be honest, was it? She she put her you know, power suits on, went off. We'll we saw her doing a little. What's the councillor do? Interfere with bins and go to drinks reception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think I think that's very similar all the way through. Like Deirdre was a councillor, Curly was a councillor. We didn't really get a mega uh, detailed impression of what these people actually did. But it's also the same with uh, with Billy in his role as Archdeacon. Now, he's been Archdeacon for a few years now, and I don't think anybody knows what it does. In, in a sense, this just kind of is the template for Corey's laissez-faire attitude to all kinds of professions. Yeah. Really. This if your place blueprint. of work isn't on the street, then who cares what it actually consists of? It really of? does show like a complete contempt for really any kind of... Gi- giving any kind of information about people's occupations, which is so bizarre mm. because... If you're talking about doing a slice of life TV show, which is basically what Coronation Street is, leaving out how people spend, you know, a good 60% of their waking life mm. seems a bit odd. Yeah, I know. Um, well, he was still working at the post office throughout all of... Oh, no, I don't think he was when he was mayor. I think he might have given it a break for a bit, but I don't know. Yeah, it, it's, it does seem like a real missed opportunity. Anyway, he gets himself into trouble really later on I'm really doubting my percentages year. now. 60%, <laughs> does that sound what? right, of your... Being awake is being at work. Because uh, you have holidays and weekends. I don't know. I don't know. It's more for me, I'll tell you that. Yeah, no. Anyway, Alf nearly gets himself in trouble later that year because he's driving out in his car and he wants to turn into somebody's driveway to like do a... Like, I've told turn you about to this. And Gemma don't... tells me, don't drive... Sometimes I'll go to drive into someone's driveway when I want to turn yeah. around and go, don't do that. No, you so don't. I have to do about How a 10 point turn in the road. How would you feel if somebody came into our driveway? You'd go mad. I don't know why somebody would want to turn in our driveway here because we've got ample space outside the front door. Because people are maniacs and they park all over the... Anyway, um, so he, he's driving into somebody's driveway. That's not the crime, but he bumps his car into an old lady there. Well, she was just Mrs. chilling Leech. out. 
She was. She was just chilling out in the That's, driveway late at why, night. This is why you don't go into people's driveways. It could be old women. Yeah. So um, he, he gets himself into a spot of bother when her son, um, Norman Leach, demands £200 compensation. 1973 we're in at the moment. Um, but Bet, and Bet was in the car with Alf at the same time, she threatens to report Norman to the police for blackmail because she kind of has a sneaking suspicion that he's got a criminal record, which he does. So he backs off. Um, and, and drops the drops the threat, uh, but he's back later on um, in the form of a mugger because uh, a couple of months later, I think he mugs Bet. Alf's worried that he's going to get away with it because of all the uh, you know the hush hush about the bumping into the old lady thing, um, and uh, so Alf decides that the only Blimey, thing that's that he 2, can do two thousand pounds. Wow, that's a lot. Alf decides that the only thing that he can do is to resign as mur. Fortunately for him, though, he learns that Leech has been sent to prison for seven years because of uh, mugging Bet. So he changes his mind about resigning from mayor just in time. In 1974, he gives it up anyway. It's all that. No I think, can you only be mayor for a year? I don't think it's, I think that's mer for a here, year. but I don't know if it's everywhere. Yeah, we do, don't we? Because we've just had our 800th mer. Um, in Southampton. It, 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 what, uh, mared up in Southampton. I can't imagine that Moors have been going for much longer than 800 years here. And now we've got Lord Mayor. So we suck on Lord that. Lord Mayor status in Southampton. Yep, yep. That's correct. Bow down to us. Yeah. In, uh, so he ends his term as Mayor and he works for Maggie in the shop for a bit. but And he t- takes it very seriously. And I think I remember she didn't like this. Yeah, I think you're right. Because she was... It was her shop. It was her business. Yeah, yeah. And he kept meddling Less around and, and thinking he, he was in charge and she did not like it. Mm-hmm. Um, he decides to propose to Maggie, but then Ron Cook, who's an old flame of hers um, that she'd recently hooked up with, <laughs> gets wind of it and asks her to marry him instead. And then Maggie accepts and Alf spends the wedding day getting drunk in the Rovers. I remember us watching that episode. He was just getting getting plastered <sighs> down the Rovers, drowning his sorrows. Yeah. The Cooks move to Zaire. Um, because, well, because uh, the showrunners planned for Alpha Maggie to get married, but Irene Sutcliffe, who played um, Maggie, quit the show. Mm. So they were like, well, we can't do that. We yeah. can't have another Phyllis. No, you can't. Lurking in the background. It's really, it's, it's, I, I often get, you know, think about the, the what could have been here, because I think when you think about Alf and relationships, Far and away, he's remembered for him and order, isn't he? Which is, you know, the, the last relationship he got into. And it took, you know, 20, 30 years for him to get together with Audrey. But nobody really remembers Rene or, or definitely not Phyllis or even very much about him, you know, having dalliances with, with Maggie. No. No. Uh, um, uh, no let's, we've, we've gone off track. 1975 then. Um, this is when Alf gets involved with a GPO canteen worker, Donna Parker. And this is what I was saying earlier, Gemma, about um, behind the scenes at the sorting office and all sorts of naughty activities that go on because she tries to get him to retrieve a letter that she regretted posting. So she says... Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so this, this, this was a letter. She, this, this woman, Donna, had found out that her lover... No, you can't say it like that. Her lover... Lover. Yeah. Um, so she she was she was going to basically tell him his wife, sorry, about their affair. So she was writing to her lover's wife saying, "I'm knocking off your husband. Sorry." And uh, then she's like, "No, maybe I shouldn't post that." Um, oh, it's like an Instagram. It, like, easier if I text you. Delete, delete. <laughs> yeah, this was this is this is like when you know you can't unsend Twitter messages and stuff. No, you still. can't unsend like emails. No, like, oh crap. And back then, you could certainly not unsend letters. Oh, could you? No, because Alf refused, oh. and Dono gets thrown out by her boyfriend. But um, good for Alf, she gets a bit attached to him actually, and the pair start seeing each other. So um, this is kind of his first. I, th- I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing ever went anywhere with Maggie. Um, so this is probably his first kind of woman that he's been with that he kind of fancies after his loveless marriage to, to his first wife. So she, she, grew, she, um, he, he ends up loaning her five hundred pounds to start Over up three thousand pounds now. Yes, thank you very much to start up a hairdressing business. What does um, she need that for? You know, scissors. Maybe um, fancy scissors and hair rolls. Rotating poles to go outside? I don't know. What is it with Alf and hairdressers? He or, loves it. Or did he say hairdressers? I don't know. Um, anyway, she takes the money in scarpers, basically. 
Alf says the whole thing has taught him a lesson, though, so he doesn't go to the police. He's like, well, I should have seen it coming. Michael, if you could get in on this game of teaching lessons for £3,000 a pop, I'd be quite happy. <laughs> How much you charge now? It's not that much, is not, it? Not that much. No. Okay, 1976, Donna eventually comes back and returns the money, along with a diamond watch. Good for her, see? He didn't go to the police and he got his money back. So and he got a watch with diamonds on it. That's, that's what everybody, if you're ever thinking that, you know, you need to go and report somebody to the cops, just say, did I learn a lesson here? Was it, you know, has it, it worth helped it? my character development? And if it does, just maybe... Did it give me a maybe... good story? Yeah, exactly. If you don't get a good storyline out of it, if the answer is yes, don't go to the police and you never know, you might you might get your money back. So, I think, win, honestly, win. I think the world would be a better place if we all imagined ourselves as characters in a soap. Do you reckon? Yeah, because you'd be more, a bit more philosophical about things then, aren't you? <laughs> like, be, be good in the story. It's going to all be on the front cover of Soap magazine with yeah. this. Yeah, you'd be you're good going to get dramas. your ambition, wouldn't it? Yeah, get yeah I it. mean, the worst thing you could be on a soap is boring. Yeah, but you'd be worried that when am I going to get the axe? I'd be worrying about that all the time. 1977, Gemma, back to you. He starts courting Rini, Rini Rini Bradshaw. Bradshaw. When she starts working at the shop. And he is quite insensitive to her needs. And um, sh- when they when they need to decide between two things, he'll always go for the cheaper option. This is I How don't know. Does, does that sounds so familiar to me. <laughs> I don't know whether this was the beginnings of Alf's um, skin flintery, but um, definitely you know the, the the type of stuff he was getting up to with Rini there was what Audrey had to suffer through through help their marriage as well. A very frugal man. He was frugal. Yes, he, you know someone's got to be, haven't they? Um. Well, mm. <laughs> someone in a relationship has got to be, otherwise you're just gonna go broke. Well, who's been spending the money this month? I it know, was not me. I know, I know. Um, so she him. makes him get rid of the bowler hat. He, it says it makes him look old. Yeah, he his his um his costume that he was well remembered for back in the early days was a bowler hat. Then he replaces it with a trilby, and that is part of his wardrobe for the rest of his life. Yes. Now Bill Podmore said about that. Um, several things intrigued me because he was coming in to be producer at this time. Several things intrigued me about the mysterious elf. How, for instance, had he managed to wander down Coronation Street in the first place? He didn't live there, and apart from his job at the local post office, plus his work as a counsellor, his only place in Weatherfield Affairs appeared to be supping pints in the Rovers. But what really fascinated me was why on earth he chose to sup them wearing a ridiculous black bowler hat. We struck a deal. Alf could stay on the condition that he wed the lovely Rini, but the hat had to go. Love that. So, yeah, this is... I remember him in that hat. It was, it didn't really suit him. Yeah, I know what you mean, but um, he, because you know, he, obviously he just didn't want to show his hair off to the nation, no, so he well, covered it right back serious, up again with the trilby. Hats were serious business back in the day, weren't they? Oh yeah, very serious. You you, you want to be taken seriously? You wear a hat. Yeah, if it, the the milliners had all the power. Oh gosh, don't talk to me about the milliners. They're basically mafia back yeah. then. Now we've days. got who wants to be a millionaire. Back then it was who wants to be a milliner because yeah. that was you know same thing. You were where it was at if you were yeah. putting a hat on somebody's head. Um, in, also in 1977, he drunkenly proposes to Rini and she accepts, but then she backtracks because she was also drunk. Yeah, so the, this was, um, you yeah, know, he, he, this is, it reminded me a little bit of Brian recently and he does another Brian S, Brian Packham-esque proposal in 1978 as well. He just doesn't, he doesn't quite get the tone right because he's, when was he born? So 20, 26, did we say? So he's like, he's in his 40s at this point and he's had no experience of romance. He can't, you know, look it up online about how to date women. So he, he just... D- can only watch television shows. Yeah, in 1977 cars. he got drunk and in 1978 he tries again to propose to her, basically listing all of the financial benefits that a union would bring to them. But isn't And surprisingly this... she turns him down. What Brian did... Yeah, exactly, that's what I'm saying. Brian did yeah. it and it was just as awkward... Um, but he's got no then. excuse because he's got the internet. Brian has got the internet, yeah. But um, no, she she kind of wants a bit more of a romantic proposal. So Alf goes off, gets a bit of a pep talk from Len Fairclough, tries again. I don't know, maybe you get through a bunch of flowers or a box of chuckies or something. Whatever it is, she accepts. And they get married very soon afterwards. I don't know exactly when the proposal was, but it was that year. And then they get married in March. So things move quickly for Alf Roberts that year. You don't want to hang around. You want to get a baby in her as soon as possible. Yeah, exactly. It it didn't work though, did it? No, not really. I don't think they ever wanted children. I don't know. Anyway, um, we saw their wedding uh, episode. And um, Rini's 
father was awful. No, her stepfather, sorry, was absolutely vile towards her, wasn't he? He was just making pops throughout the episode about how the fact that she wasn't, you know... She's not the least unattractive woman in the room, but she's close kind of thing. And um, <laughs> uh, at, at, the, at the reception afterwards, he says, oh, well, good, good fair play to you for marrying Marina. You mean, she, she's no oil painting, is she? And Alf just shoves him over to teach him a lesson. So that good was, for you, Alf. never say that again, will he? He should have charged him to a fencing duel. Yeah. That would have surprised Slapped us. Slapped him around the face with a glove. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think we ever saw any of Elf's um, sword fighting prowess in Coronation Street. You That's know, we, weird. We had, um, you know, Ashley Peacock had a bit of a go with the old boxing, didn't he? Because of Stephen Arnold was also a, a, a boxer off screen. But, uh, but you know, Alf didn't get the chance. He's just a fighter ranger. He's not a fight haver. Oh yeah, very true. Um, so anyway, I thought you said he's a fighter ranger, like a fighter slash ranger. He only fights from afar. <laughs> one one, oh, I was going, the bow and one day he's a fighter, the next day he's telling children not to set fires in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> or is it a power <laughs> ranger? <laughs> then he would be fighting, but he'd be, only be fighting aliens. Yeah, power rangers are fighter rangers, aren't they? They are. Why are we going off track again? So, they move into the shop. The new Robert I'm just says, imagining Alf and Rini as Power Rangers. <laughs> if, you know, if what it started would 20 they be? years she'd earlier. She'd be the pink one, obviously. She'd be the pink one because she'd yeah, be the girl she's ranger. The girl. I don't think Alf would just be the white ranger because I was imagining him there in his grocer's uniform. Just but imagine him doing point, all these like, elaborate arm so. movements going, I'm going to fight you. What what uh, what dinosaur would he have as his Power Ranging? Diplodocus. Do you reckon? I don't think they exist. I thought they were a myth. I don't know. Right, come on. We got back. This is a long word as it is. Or is it so, a diplodocus? I don't know. Um, they move into the corner shop flat with Bet. Um, although they find it increasingly awkward to have her walking around half dressed. Um, and they don't enjoy her boyfriends being over in the flat as well half the time. So he tries to give Bet the old heave ho, including a disastrous attempt to set her up with Fred G at the pub. Poor Bet having to um, go along with that one. No thanks. Um, and they end up try- uh, giving up trying to kick her out when Rini's mum says, Oh, I'll come and move in with you. And they go, Nah, you're all right, ma'am. We'll Let's just keep, keep Bet. Bet. Yeah. yeah. In 1979, the couple argue because he wants to jack in his job at the GPO, the general post office, to work in the shop full time. But she thinks this is a bad move. They're gonna get, we're gonna get under each other's feet. Mm-hmm. Alf gets left comatose for three oh, days no. when a lorry crashes into the Rovers. They make up, and then he returns to his old job. Yes, yeah, so this, this is this is that was a great episode, wasn't it? This was a really great storyline too, because this was like where where Nick got his uh, storyline almost from. Because after uh, Alf had come out of his coma, yes. he was left with um, being quite prone to angry outbursts. He's literally, is Nick. Yeah, uncharacteristic. Nick, but 30 years earlier. Yeah, uncharacteristic of Alf. It was a bit sadder. I th- wasn't it a bit more sad? Because Alf was I think only we gentle. made it a joke when Nick was uh, there. Getting, getting a bit, Maybe. You know. <laughs> brain damaged and angry um, so he, he yeah he rips into people including Annie Walker and his boss at the post office and Rini mm. so um, that's the sign of uh, somebody who actually cannot control their temper what well you know um, you know sometimes you hear people who are um, domestic abusers or something and they lose their temper at their partner and they say oh, I can't I can't help myself but somehow magically they can control their temper around mm. everybody oh, else yeah. but I've not I've just their... got mad at everybody exactly. for a little bit in 1979 yeah so um, he ends up going he's probably to see... just had it pent up inside him for the last 50 years and he's like this is the perfect excuse to let let rip yeah um, he goes to see a psychiatrist mm-hmm. and neurologists Didn't and eventually they had those things back in those days he's given a clean bill of health and he gets £800 in compensation for the crash, but he is peeved to hear that Betty got £300 and she only got a cut on the head. <laughs> I think that's not fair. I agree with him. I know. Well, you know, he, he agrees on the £800 first and then he goes around saying, oh, I've got £800 out of like this. What did you get? And Betty's like, oh, I've got £300. So it's too late to... to, to to up, up, your, up your your demands, isn't it? I want to know what Deirdre got from the mental scarring of thinking that Tracy was buried under the rubble. 
Because that was a great episode, wasn't it? The uh, the lorry crash. All and kinds of things. The only thing that everyone good. ever thinks of in that is literally Deirdre going around going, Tracy, Tracy. But yeah, poor Alfie. No, Alf. lots of other things happened poor as well. Poor old Alfie didn't, he didn't come out of that very well. But he was fine by the end of the year, so who cares? Um, and then um, what happens at the end of the year, Gemma? He takes the opportunity to leave the post office for good and he starts to work at the shop and it doesn't turn out too bad. Doesn't turn out too bad whatsoever. So this was properly the start of his career as a grocer all of this time into the show but that's what you know if somebody was to say what, what did house roberts what was his calling in life it would be his little shop wouldn't he because he loved that shop yeah and then in 1980 they move into the um kathy and um brian storyline do they Tell do you want me. to do you want I to thought it was your go. <laughs> I we alternate to so yeah we're we'll fine if you want to yeah they decide um reed really decides that they want to go to the countryside to, to live there and buy a shop with a post office in See? there. So you're right, this is very much like Brian and Kathy recently going down to Cornwall. So really, Alf Roberts' story is like the template for all Coronation Street characters to come. Yeah, basically. I can't wait for the bit where, um, uh, I don't know, you've already had the bit with Maria and getting beaten up. Um, I can't wait for the bit where Spider changes his w- woolen hat for a trilby. I can't wait for the bit where Alf kicks someone to death and then gets away with it. I can't wait for the bit... <laughs> I can't wait for the bit where somebody drives their car and their brother dies in the car crash and then they have to marry their wife. I can't, no, I can't wait for that <laughs> that's, it, that's it, that's it. Enough. So they find a buyer for their shop, the corner shop, and they go to a country pub to celebrate. But alas! Pull through the face and you're too blame. Gemma's favourite miss... Uh, her her favourite Nelson Mandela moment of Coronation Street is that Rini does not Why get do a pole that? through the face. That's what it's called, isn't it? A Mandela moment. Mandela effect. It's not called the Nelson Mandela moment. <laughs> I don't, is it not? I, call I just it need that. to explain that reference now because lots of people don't know what you mean. There's a theory. Yeah, we've got very clever Listen, listeners. there's a theory out there that says that there are multiple parallel universes and you can move between them accidentally without realising it because... Uh, it all started out with a bunch of people who could have sworn when Nelson Mandela died that he'd already died years ago in prison and they wouldn't shut up about saying that's exactly what happened. And since then, there have been an entire industry of people misremembering things or, or getting confused about something and then saying that because they remember something differently to the way it actually did happen, it must be they're from a parallel universe where that is in fact the case. So I am actually from a parallel universe where Rini got a pole through the face um, in a car, which funnily enough is strange because I didn't even watch the show no, when it was on. So you did. I think it must have come from me. Well, what happens? They go out driving and Rini's, <laughs> Rini's learning to drive at this point and um, they get stuck in um, like roadworks, don't they? Where it's they like have a little to... walled... It's like a little country lane, but it's walled, like brick walls either side. It's like in a dip, isn't it, with mm, trees above? I think so. Yeah, and, and then they have to Well, in to my do... universe it was. Exactly. Who knows what it actually was? It could have been in the middle of the city for as far as we know. But as, far, if, as my memory tells it now that I've actually watched the episode, they, uh, they, it's their turn to go past the temporary traffic lights or past the roadworks on the, on the right of them. But um, then the car stalls and all, and um, really gets herself into a bit of a flat because of it. So Al's like, fine, I will get out and drive. Now he's he's a bit tipsy, isn't he? Because he's been um, enjoying knocking well, back the air at the pub. But anyway, he decides that he's going to get out of the car, uh, go around. Rini kind of hops over into um, the other seat. But all this time um, has meant that the lights have gone red. So the other cars come their direction and... Pull smash. through the face. They get hit by... Well, Rini herself gets hit by a 10-ton truck. And yeah. uh, doesn't survive, does she? She gets no. carried off to hospital and she's, she's alive for a little bit afterwards. But um, that was the end of Rini Bradshaw. Car and accident. Quite a good episode, actually. It was really good, yeah. And I was like, thank God for that. I was nearly in that. I know it was nearly Could have me. Been me. Could have been me, talking about alternate universes. Oh, and all the viewers are like, oh, I'm glad it was Rini, not mm. Alf. Well, I think a lot of viewers were quite pleased for that because um, I don't think the Roberts were a particularly popular couple. Um, so that's why the, they bumped off Rini to give Alf a shot with somebody else. And I'm sure we could all name some Coronation Street couples right now where you think, let's get one pole of them killed the off with a pole through the face and maybe the other character can have a, another another shot with somebody else. But Pill Podmore said, um, if time proved anything, I think it underlined that the decisions to kill off characters were correct. Alf Roberts emerged into the sunlight from the shadows of a rather humdrum marriage oh and eventually God. with his brash new bride Audrey became the wonderful cornerstone character he is today which God. is absolutely true. I feel bad for the actress who plays Rini saying okay. yes. The producer saying this dullard. I'm glad that we bumped her off so that he could go on and have a much better partner 
for, nice in, young new bride. Next. Yeah, basically. But it's absolutely true because Elf and Audrey were a proper iconic Coronation yeah, Street really couple, were. weren't they? It's because Rini was too. She wasn't dissimilar to Elf, but she wasn't different enough to make any conflict, really. I just kind of. I, I mean, we, we've seen a few episodes of Rini on, haven't we? And I just see her as. She's just a bit of a nothing character. I think. I suppose she was a bit strong willed, but I kind of. I, in my head, she's just there kind of grinning away behind the shop counter behind her big Deirdre spec. Yeah, she just know? looked like proto Deirdre. She really was proto Deirdre, wasn't she? That's yeah. in my head I, I I get the two mixed up really. Nineteen eighty one, um this is when Alf goes on holiday to Scarborough and uh he asks Audrey Funnily enough, in what? my universe it was Blackpool. What? <laughs> he goes to Scarborough and asks Audrey to look after the shot while he's away. So Audrey's on the scene now. He comes back to find that she spent most of her time instead running a hair salon in the back room. Loved it. Uncharacteristically for Alf, he's quite impressed with her entrepreneurial endeavours and lets her carry on the business there. So yeah, fair play to her. Why would he get mad? She can't... He... Well, because he's, she's How supposed many to be looking after the shop. You leave a woman alone and she come back and there's more money than you started with. Well, I suppose it must be to do with that, yeah. That was a very sexist comment, but I thought it was funny. Alf starts to (laughs) realise... No, you're allowed to say that. You're a lady yourself. (laughs) Alf starts to realise that he has feelings for Audrey. That's called internalised misogyny, Michael. (laughs) He even lets Audrey talk him into buying a fancy sports car. So they're not dating at this point. No, not really. So he she, so he goes on holiday, says, here you go, look after this. You're my mate, look and after the shop And then when he comes walk. back, she's just running a business in a different part of the building. Yeah, but just for fun though. She 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 says to Elsie, you know, I'm just having a bit of fun with Elf. I've got, I'm in no way serious about settling down well, with this guy. There was an age gap, wasn't there, I think. Yeah, yeah, El- Elfie was definitely, um, was older than Audrey for sure. That was from the episode, um, when, when people, when they go to get this car people start getting really gossipy about it. And that had the quote where um, Bet's talking to, to Annie about it in the Rovers and Bet says, you don't go in for gossip, do you, Mrs. Walker? And Annie's like, no, dear. Why? <laughs> was, I love that. That was absolutely, was I think... Great. That was just such a clever, clever line. Yeah. Like, it really, really was. Yeah. I, I I wouldn't dare lower myself to that, but if you've got some gossip, just fill. Why well, not? I need to know what you're talking about now. So Alf proposes to Audrey that November. He moves fast, this guy, in his new sports car, I presume. Mm. But um, she has been forewarned by Elfie, by Elsie, sorry, that Alf was going to pop the question, and she turns him down because, like I said earlier, she does not want to commit. This sucks because the only bird he can get is his. Um, is an ugly one or his brother's dead the dead brother's widow yeah can't get anybody else to marry him no. unless he asks him more than once but he's a nice guy wasn't he I mean he, I think the thing with Alf was that he was just very kind of normal everyday guy I mean he was the mayor as well I suppose but he was very just you know there wasn't anything mega exciting about him he was a very safe option and Audrey being the, the flighty piece that she was wanted a bit more adventure in her life well, yeah, she wanted a man that was like more like a sports car. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Alf was, you know, what was it? I, I don't know anything to do with cars. Range Rover. Uh, I'm going to say a Skoda? It's, it's a reliable, but A reliant Robin. I don't know anything about cars. Move on. 1983, um, there's a, he has a slimming contest. It's Alf, Eddie, Fred and Stan. And he wins... He loses. He only loses three pounds. So at all of them, the, the most they could lose was three pounds. I know it's pretty pretty bad. And they were it? big lads too because they would have had a lot to lose. That's the thing. When you're a bloke and you've got a lot to lose, when you start out, it's actually quite easy at the beginning. You can lose quite a lot. Apparently, it falls off. But but he almost didn't win, did he? Because um, Fred yeah, Fred cheating. Fred G tried to cheat by having a bag of coins in his pocket in the first way, and so it looked. Once it was all over, that he lost a lot more. But I can't remember how it came out. But hooray for what hooray for Alf! You won. Pie. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> and put it right back on again. He rows with Bet when um, he refuses to stop using the flat as a love. No, hang on. She refuses to stop using mm-hmm. the flat as a love nest for her new boyfriend, who is the counsellor and a married man. Married man. Shocking. 1983. The Foster. Des Foster. Bet chooses Des over the flat, but backtracks when it turns out that she's just one of his many side pieces. Mm-hmm. I like the. I love the fact she's like, look, I know you're cheating on me um, with your wife, 
but other women as well, I draw the line. I know. I've got. Self-respect. I thought I had you down as a two-woman man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Alf gets re-elected as councillor again in 1984, so they kind of decide to revisit his um, political leanings in the 80s. But he almost gets in trouble for persuading the town hall committee to reject a proposal for a new shopping plaza because he doesn't want competition. Oh, corruption in the government! Yeah. I can't believe it. He does not it. want anyone going anywhere this else. This wouldn't and they, happen in real life. They kind of they revisit this a few times during Elf's uh, tenure in the in the shop like when um, there's competition from Better Buys in the early 90s do you remember when um, they have the Better Buy bus yes. which is, is going from Coronation Street to, to the shop and yeah, to basically like to poach Elf's coat customers and he gets on the bus like what are you all doing going to Better Buys you like, support oh, your need... local businesses where else am I going to buy Norwegian prawns <laughs> good reference Thanks. but yeah. Norwegian prawns came about five years after that so um, no points I bet they sold them what? Where'd they get the prawns from then? Oh yeah, good point. Um, anyway, the Gazette gets wind of this story about the shopping plaza, but luckily for Alf, the community doesn't really care, and he gets away with it. And this is when we began to slide into chaos in this country. Yeah. Once you let them get away with that, That's the apathy, yeah. now look where we are. <laughs> in 1985, he plans to buy number 13 and expand the shop into it, but he learns that Hilda only wants to sell it because the roof is sagging and she can't afford to pay for the repairs. But it turns out... Get, actually, get Ed on it, he'll do it. Well, it turns out there's something wrong with the roof. After all, the builder was just trying to con her. But So she pulls out of the sale and then Alf decides to extend into the shop's back room anyway. Yeah, and then the back room of the shop, you got to see quite a lot of in the, the first 20-odd years of the show, didn't you? It was massive. You? A huge, like, back living room area. Because um, you've got your upstairs uh, above the shop now, which is where Daniel's living. But there was, there, yeah, there's a huge other living area, but... That's what we happened. saw lots he of it the back in the old days. In the, in the mid eighties, yeah, yeah. So this he, is, and that's where Audrey did her um her hairdressing when he was away that time. I remember well. the Hopkins spending a lot of time in that room. Yes, yeah, being boring. <laughs> <laughs> Alf's mini market. That's what it turns into. It opens yeah. in September, and Bet cuts the ribbon. She's Miss Weatherfield. No, no, she she had been Miss Weatherfield. She was Miss Weatherfield she? about twenty years previously. Well, they were going to have current Miss Weatherfield, and then, then she, she decided up. not to come, and so. Old Miss Weatherfield came and oh, don't let her use calling her that. At the end of the day, a drunken elf because they they put all this wine out, didn't they? And everyone was yeah. helping themselves. And yeah. he gets completely smashed, and so he proposes to Rita. Rita turns him down, and then he has another crack at her when she's he's sober, but she says no. Yeah, he gets a message after that. Not so then, interested. Audrey comes back to the area and throws herself at Alf after being dumped by her boyfriend Paul. She borrows Alf's car and then she crashes it. Mm-hmm. Um, he gets mad she cries so he proposes yeah <laughs> <laughs> and she's like times. well I got out of that one <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> so she marries to avoid her insurance claim <laughs> yeah and then they get married that December literally yeah. Elf is a fast mover isn't he get yeah. the ring on the finger get her up the well, aisle quick before it, she changes her mind exactly he knows that it's not necessarily a done deal mm. so um, they get married well, yeah yeah, not, you know, even once the, the ring's on the finger, it's not a done deal. If you look at what Fizz has been getting up to recently. Exactly. On Street. So, um, Al's got a, a hangover when they get married because he got drunk the night before. <laughs> because um, they had a Christmas pudding competition, didn't they? Mm. And he got so drunk that he sat on the prize winning one, which was Percy Sugden's. Yeah, I think that Sam Tyndall had bought it as well. Uh, disgraced yeah, that's himself. right. Yeah. 1986, um, Audrey was like... I'm not living in the corner shop, you know, and I got married really quickly last December, but we're not staying here, are we? So she finds herself a posh detached house that she'd much prefer to Where's live that, in. Where's that then? Away from the street. What? No, you can't do that. Um, Alf says, well, you know, Audrey's done very well away from the street in the, in the years since, hasn't she? I know, but... she's, she's like one of the most successful off-street characters. Yeah, she really, really is. But she's not there yet, yeah. She, she no. wants to buy this detached house. Alf says, look, no, okay, let's let's buy number 11 Coronation Street instead. So it's a step up from living above our, our shop. Um, number but not 11. By a lot. No, I can't remember who'd lived there before. It was, was this, this must have been after Elsie Tanner left around about that time. Um, anyway, Rob Audrey's like, and she's not particularly happy about it, but it's better than a living above the shop. And it gives her the opportunity as well to run a salon from the house's front room there as well, which is pretty cool between shifts at the shop. Um, because she's not, she's, she's not, she's not, like not really, she doesn't really like working in the shop, no, but hair is her thing. Yeah, hair is her thing. Mm-hmm. In 1987, Ken decides to stand in the upcoming council election and he uses his position on the recorder to print letters slamming Alf. Ken. More corruption. I know. When Alf gets Ken in trouble with his boss about this, um, 
the boss threatens to sack Ken unless he stands down from the election, then Deirdre resigns from the shop and decide, decides to stand for the council herself. Mm-hmm. What? This is like the biggest political scandal I've ever heard of. <laughs> Despite no experience, yeah, Deirdre... Yeah, none of them found themselves deep faked on porn sites, did That's they? That's true, yeah. Despite no experience, Deirdre's very popular, which sounds very familiar to me as well. <laughs> um, she wins with 811 votes and Alf only gets 804. Pretty close. Then... After, I think, doesn't Alf, um, don't they fall out with each other, but then kind of Alf, when he win, when she wins, kind of congratulates her, doesn't I he? I think so, yeah. But yeah. then he has to retire from the shop because he has a heart attack after the celebrations, hmm. during, the, during the post-election celebrations. Then he goes back to, uh, to work two weeks later because he found being retired more stressful than working in a shop. He, he was a bit of a job's worth was Alf, wasn't he? Well, this is the, this is the executive monkey problem. Explain. Um, they did experiments, very unethical experiments about monkeys, and they gave them electric shocks. And they found they gave one group of monkeys electric shocks and they couldn't avoid it. And they gave another set of monkeys a button. And if they heard a sound, they could press the button and stop themselves from getting electric shocks. Mm. And most of these monkeys got so stressed out that they died of the stress oh, of yeah. having to press the button. Mm. And that, I think, is a metaphor for human existence. Yeah. I can't criticise that too much because. Sometimes someone might accuse me of working too hard as well. I was going to say, does that mean you're never going to retire? <laughs> I've never been looking forward to What are you going to do with yourself? I don't know. More podcasting. We're going to start a new podcast? Yes. Okay. Right, 1988. Alf is accused of being racist when he chooses Curly Watts over Shirley Armitage to live in the shop flat. Um, because Wasn't this a setup? I can't remember how it happened. Because and Shirley were dating, weren't they? Yeah, I can't... Yeah, yes, they had been. They were dating. I don't know whether they were dating before or after. But anyway, Shirley asks first, can I have the flat? Curly then asks. But I can't remember the reason that Alf gives. I'm sure it's not because I'm a massive racist. But he chooses Curly um, over Shirley. I'm not racist. I'm sexist. Yes, exactly. Um, so anyway, they decide to just move into the shop together anyway. And Alf says, oh yeah, fine, okay. Um, if you must, because Emily threatens to tell people about Alf being racist unless he agrees to let Shirley live there with Curly. So a um, bit, bit of a black mark on Alf's um, character p- profile there. Let's move on. Nearly has a b- nervous breakdown later on in 1988 um, when Audrey goes to Canada for three months because Stephen... You know, that's Stephen Who's Reed Stephen? In, in the show at the moment? Yeah. Um, he's involved in a car crash there. So Audrey goes over to Canada to look after him. And he's, she's staying at Malcolm Reed's house. So this and he is... has flashbacks about his dead brother. Oh gosh, yeah, another Malcolm he was in the family. Malcolm. Yeah, Malcolm Reed is Stephen's dad. And there's another car Obviously, crash. Obviously, um, Audrey and Malcolm were quite close once upon a time because that's how Stephen came about. So um, Alf is like, my, my wife is over there for three months with her, with her ex-lover. And everyone knows what it's like in Canada. Yeah, I know. It's, it's the country the, the of love. The country of love. <laughs> As everybody says. <laughs> They've got, you know... They're the heart of the middle of their flag, isn't it? If you yeah, squint exactly, a little bit. Yeah. That's why in, in, in French Canada, in Le Père de Yeah, exactly. Malcolm comes over to England towards the end of the year, and uh, so we get, we get a visit. That's our first big Canadian visitor in Coronation Street, and Alf is very suspicious of his intentions towards Audrey. And um, there's this great episode. Um, when they go to Blackpool, I think, on a coach trip, and Alf spends the episode, like, stalking um, Audrey and Malcolm. Originally, Alf refuses to go on the trip, if I, if I remember right, but he goes anyway so that he can spy on them, keep tabs on Audrey. And um, he ends up storming onto the coach at the end of the episode, threatening to knock Malcolm's block off, and he basically drags Audrey home. Um, and... I suppose he was right because Malcolm had proposed to Audrey or, or maybe asked her to come back to Canada during the episode. So Alf was right to be suspicious. But um, yeah, maybe the, the dragging Audrey off the coach was probably not the best of she ideas. She doesn't like it. No, no. She says no. She says she said no to the, to the proposal. I'm not going to get off the coach, but I'm not going to marry him. I'm yes. going to go home and have a cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. In 1989, Audrey sets her heart on moving into one of the flats in Weatherfield Keys. And Alf humours her. He puts number 11 on the market at a very high price, thinking nobody's going to buy it. But, unfortunately for him, the McDonald's do. And Audrey then admits that this um, Keyside flat is going to be too expensive and she wants to buy a semi-detached house in Hillside Crescent. However, the house gets taken off the market 
but the McDonald's had already moved into number 11, and so the Roberts have to live above the corner shop for a few months. That was a great And Audrey episode. is not happy about this at all. Yeah, I don't know I don't know how this actually happens or whether it could actually happen, but yeah, it turned out well, we... that they moved out of their house. The house they were meant to be moving into falls through, so they're basically left homeless. Theoretically possible in this country, because suppose... of how stupid. It is a bit silly. We ne- but... That nearly happened to us. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know, nearly did. But um, so, yeah, they, 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 the, the episode where Alf takes Audrey up to this grotto flat above the corner shop which I think hasn't been lived in for a good few years that was quite funny because you know Audrey's a lady of high standards isn't she well it's not gonna lower us can I just say it's a good job that they moved in there if nobody was living there because that's a waste of income very true I can't believe Skinflint um Alf let that empty well he was going he, he did at the beginning didn't he well no he was living there himself but I don't know. Anyway, 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 1990. This is the start of a new era for Alf and Audrey because this is finally when they purchase Five Grassmere Drive <laughs> where Audrey has been living since. 32 years she's been living in this house. Why would you move out of that palace? Well, exactly. Why would you? Yeah. Um, so and there was a funny scene around that time as well where they go to a bed shop to try and get themselves a bed for the new flat um, and Audrey catches Alf testing out a bed with Rita. They're just sitting on it, Why? everybody. And uh, Audrey's like, what are you doing there, sitting there with that trollop? I'm going to make you buy the most expensive bed in the shop to appease me. So, sorry about that one, Alf. Audrey causes a feud between Jim and Alf later in the year as well, when um, this is when... She's she's basically the bored housewife in this story, and Jim comes round her house to fix the TV or the area or something, and she has him skipping around doing jobs for her and making inappropriate advances towards Jim. And, um, yeah, that just leads to, to Alf and Jim having a bit of a um, an, an argument. Um, also, and this is great as well, I, Alf and Audrey were the best couple, weren't they? They were so good in, in this era. It, was, it took them a long time to get there, but um, yeah, the, really the relationship good, really good that the fun. two of them had was really, really fun. Just Audrey uh, getting away with, or trying to get away with so many things, and Alf was just there kind of tutting or rolling his eyes and being quite sensible, I would say. But um, yeah, the, the dynamic between them was just great. So anyway, um, Audrey discovers that Alf's been um, diddling the taxes a little bit at the shop and saying that Audrey was a salaried worker there. Um, so she she basically finds out that Alf apparently now owes her £10,000. I remember this. He, he said, oh yeah, uh, Audrey Roberts, we paid her, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, she's like, well, I, I haven't been Where's a salaried worker. Then? Gimme, gimme, gimme. And she basically starts spending a load of Alf's money, including a swish car for Gail and Martin and a birthday present for Alf, which is a trip to a health farm, which he wasn't at all keen on. Um, if you could see no, Alf, that. then you would um, you would see that he's not really the sort of health farm sort of person. So Audrey, but Audrey loves the idea, and she ends up going with Alma instead. So good for her. Um, later on that year, and this is where we've got the link to what's been going on in Coronation Street recently, Alf is made president of the Weatherfield Association of Retail Traders and Stockholders, a.k.a. Warts. Yeah. This is who Audrey was pretending she was going to give her money to just recently. So it's not the Weatherfield Association of Retail Traders, traders. and Stuff. No, it's not. Stockholders. Stockholders. In 1991, fellow Warts member Vivian Barford persuades Alf to run for council against she Deirdre was very again. Was Vivian. But she does with Alec Gilroy as his campaign manager. Now, with him behind you, how could you fail? Yeah. Alf tries to sell himself to the voters as a family man. He makes them well, he makes them well aware that Deirdre is twice divorced. Can you imagine such an evil woman in <laughs> government? I can't. This is what, I mean, all, all the, I can't remember what Sally was trying to, what dirt Sally was trying to get on Maria, but I mean, it didn't, wouldn't take long to get up something a bit more juicy than just twice divorced, was it? I mean, these days, our Prime Minister doesn't even know how many kids he's got. He <laughs> no, won't no. leave. He's resigned, but he won't leave. Yeah. So I don't think this scandal was really worth making much fuss oh. out over. Well, it was back then. It was back then. Deirdre's friend Phil Jennings then spreads rumours that Alf is having it away with Vivian Barford. Then the Gazette runs a piece on election day which is accompanied by a picture of Deirdre's ex Ken pushing Alf. He is re-elected with 1,515 votes. So when you say it's a picture of Ken... It's a picture of Ken pushing Alf. They, they have a bit of a they have a bit of a whoa in the pub. So he's not like pushing him to success. He's no. literally pushing him. This over. this was the time when um, 
Deirdre had kicked Ken out and you remember he was getting a bit suicidal and just oh, very yeah. bereft and trying to get back with Deirdre so yeah. I think he was trying to say look Deirdre I'm on your side um, I'll push a man over yeah and then he puts a picture on the front yeah and then it doesn't work doesn't work out for Deirdre so Alf is elected again Alf hires Ivy to work in the shop Ivy Brennan alongside Audrey as he is now too busy of all this council business. Bear in mind, this is a guy that retired like, like a few years ago. Yeah, I know. He um, just, he, that's the thing. He the shopkeeping was in his blood. He just couldn't, didn't want to get away from it. Yeah, shop to your drop. Yeah. Um, Ivy persuades him to lengthen the shop's opening hours, which annoys Audrey. Um, she's still working there, and so she walks out on yeah, the job. Yeah, Audrey and Ivy together. They uh, they really rubbed each other up the wrong yeah, because, way. They were they yeah. were chalk and cheese. Ivy just gets on with there. things, and Audrey's like, I can't be bothered with this. Yeah. I'm the wife. I shouldn't have Audrey, to do Audrey was very. Uh, Ivy was very keen. Um, she also had, a, you know, a very. She was a very moralistic sort of person, wasn't she? And um, and Audrey just being a flighty, she whatever no she rules, wants. whatever she wanted. Um, yeah. So they, they had some great scenes together. Yeah. So she walks out, stays at a five star hotel to get Alf back. Then he cancels her credit card, so she has to come back. Then um, she finds him in his dressing gown with Vivian there, but actually he just got out of the bar. So she gets upset and she dumps herself on Gail and says she's getting a divorce. <laughs> then Alf collapses with nervous exhaustion, so Audrey goes back to him. And by this time, Ivy's left to go to work in Better Buys, so Audrey has to go back to the shop. That was a sound of drama, wasn't it? That sounded like... Uh, off screen at this time, Brian Molesby had suffered a really serious heart attack at the beginning of 1991. Um, and he was in the middle of the story, basically, and they had to cut it short. And there's been a few times um, since when Coronation Street has had to radically alter the path of a storyline because of a character, an actor, not being able to appear in the show for one reason or another. But basically, this is going to be a long-running story. But they said, well, Alf's had a Alf's collapse. They didn't see this attack, this collapse, of course, because Brian was off-screen himself. And they said, oh, yeah, all just gone back to, to Alf, and, and that put the kibosh on that one, really. Um, in 1992, Alf collapses again at the Warts Christmas dinner from a stomach ulcer. And, and the 90s, um, although I think it was really was peak Alf and Audrey period, it was also characterised a little bit by Alf and sadly Brian Molesley um, having you know, increasingly severe health conditions. But um, it, was, it was almost done in a funny way for this Christmas episode because um, it tied up, it tied along with a story where I think Percy Sugden had accused Alf of s selling stale uh, mince pies or something like that. No, Christmas puddings it was, I think. Um, and so Alf says, well, my, there's nothing wrong with my Christmas puddings. Um, so he decides to prove everybody that, um, that they're all good by eating a whole one in the middle of the Rover. So he's, he's gone to this Warts Christmas dinner Full Christmas pudding in his stomach. He's had a cummerbund on as well. And uh, it's no surprise that he collapses in the middle of the occasion. So Audrey puts him on a diet and gives him a strict exercise regime. You should do that to me. I'm quite likely to do that kind of thing. I like strangle by my you cummerbund want me to arrange... after eating an entire Christmas pudding. I don't think you trust me in charge of the... Uh the food in I the think, house. honestly, I think if you were in charge of the food, I would lose weight rapidly. I wouldn't because I'll obviously say I'd just be giving you, you know, if I was left to my own devices, I think I'd just be eating like really, really bad stuff and fast food and chocolate and no, stuff. No, but you'd eat lots of pasta bakes and I would just refuse to eat them. Oh yeah, I'd be putting a load of horrible stuff that you don't like, that's yeah. true. 1993, after hearing that a friend died of a heart attack, Alf, now 67, decides to sell the shop to Brendan Scott. I love, I love when you read these notes and something comes along and you go, I, I know, I remember is. this. I'm going to say this with Scott, a flourish. Brendan Scott, the Star Wars captain. <laughs> and he retires, taking the mini market sign and the bacon slicer home as a memento. And he's also made a lifetime member of Warp. Mm. So Brendan Scott had been um, one of the higher up managers at the Better Buy chain, hadn't he? And he was like... Um, very fierce and and stern and severe. He knew what and, he wanted to be done. Yeah, and a rather unpleasant character. And he buys the shop off Alf and turns it into an oldie worldy Victorian. And he makes Deirdre wear a bonnet. Yeah, yeah, it's really really and funny. An apron. And, and he's there with his straw boater and everything. I he, loved it. He, that lasts about what a month, two months before oh. he has a heart attack himself. Our stories are just full of people having heart attacks. It's a bit of a downer, isn't it? Maybe he's given off some kind of noxious fumes. Maybe it is, yeah. Later that year, uh, the Roberts decided to move to Lytham St Anne's and put five Grassmere Drive up for auction. 
And while they're waiting for the lot to come up, Alf's surprised to hear the corner shop is also being bid on because Brendan Scott has died and he just instinctively bids on it. <laughs> and then he gets it back for way less than he sold it for earlier in the year. And I'll just like... Alf must have been so proud of himself. For I that. know. Audrey's like, no, this is not was... what we were supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yes, yes, I've got a bargain. Right, quick quiz, Gemma. Name another classic Coronation Street character that did retire to live in St Anne's. Um, it was, um, Ina Sharples. Yes, well done, good job. Thank you very much. 1994, the council revives the position of Mayor of Weatherfield. Sorry, Mur. I don't, I don't, just didn't anything? have a Mur between, no, I don't No, like, no one's as good as you, we just won't <laughs> yeah. have it anymore. So they, they, they say, Alf, do you want to, do you want to be Mayor again? I don't it's think like, yeah, all right then. This is more political corruption. Yeah. So Audrey loves the sound of being Mayoress. Very similar to, to Annie Walker back in the day. You know, you get to wear your nice clothes, you get to go to the posh do's and everything. So she persuades Reg Holdsworth to put in an offer on the shop. Alf sells up and accepts the position of Moor with Audrey making... just She just loves... Uh, loves it, but she also does make awful fun of some of the pomp and ceremony around the mayor. Well, she's so dismissive, isn't she? And Audrey's... she just wants to, to go to the posh do's and have a limo. But the whole, you know, there's a, a lot of old fashioned rigmarole and stuff. Like Al Alf has to be outside the mayor's chambers and then has to be dragged in kicking and screaming or something, doesn't he? And that's just part of the tradition. And Audrey thinks it's a load of rubbish, but she she doesn't care because she gets to be mayoress after it. Well, the thing is about Audrey is that people don't really think of her as being dismissive and cutting so much, but she really is. Yeah, yeah, she can be horrible sometimes. Yeah. Um, so anyway, she doesn't end up particularly enjoying being the mayor. Um, uh, mayor's uh, wife. The, the mayor's wife, sorry, um, once she gets going with it, because she has to go to these boring engagements like this. primary school fates and um, oh, supermarket yeah, but... scissor cutting, ribbon cutting ceremonies. I know there's not very ma very many um, alcoholic beverages at, at school fates, but surely you can bring your own pims. Just give me a glass of pims and a nice dress. I'll show up anyway. There was, there was one thing that they went to, which is quite funny. It was the 100th birthday of, um, of one of the, the residents of Weatherfield, and this Mrs. Jobson. And um, it turns out that she was a neighbour of Alf's when he was a little boy. And when Alf's there tucking into the birthday cake himself, she's like, I don't remember you, it's Fat Alfie. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there was a, another really famous Alf uh, and Audrey little mini storyline in the summer of that this year as well, because they go across to France. Charleville, which is a made-up city in France that had been supposedly twinned with Weatherfield. But where did they go to film this? Um, England. Mm. This was not filmed in France. Um, but they have, a, la vie. they have a black pudding contest there. Fred Elliott goes along as well, and that was one of the very early appearances of Fred, who basically disgraces Weatherfield by attempting to bribe the judges there. Now, Alf um, stands up for Fred. He, he, would, he didn't really know him that well back at that time, and he thought he would never do that, and then he does a big speech about how he's untwinning ceremoniously uh, Weatherfield with Charleville. But um, I think later on in the year, he learns that Fred actually does have a bit of a reputation for taking backhanders. So he probably was trying to bribe them. <laughs> so he, he hurriedly retwins them again. Yeah, because um, Fred was a bit more sleazy. Oh, gosh. Fred, when he first... Fred was really sleazy was back in proper, the early days. Like, he... he came, he, he left as a much beloved character, yeah. didn't he? But he was a really kind of... Gross. Bit of a creep. He was a Pe not 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 Reg Holdsworth granddad. level, but not quite. But oh, you're a very fine snoozing. woman, Audrey. Very snoozy. Very, she's a very handsome woman, is that Audrey Roberts? He'd say, mm. and he's trying to whisk her away from Alf and stuff. But anyway, um, Alf um, volunteers later in the year to give up the mayoral limo when the council is planning um, financial cutbacks. Audrey's like, no way. That's the only thing I enjoy about. Yeah, I'm not this. giving up my. She's limo. also made friends with the limo driver as well. But uh, yeah, she she says, well, well, if you do that, I'm going to resign as um, as, as mayoress. So she, he's like, well, go on then. And so he, he gets rid of the car, gets rid of her, and ends up giving Betty Williams the position of, um, of mayoress. So um, there's also, and this isn't particularly an Alf storyline, but it was a notable moment. There was, I remember a scene at the end of 94 when um, he sees Martin having a bit of a kiss Christmas kiss with one of his fellow nurses, doesn't he? He's walking. I think, I can't, I think he's in the hospital to do some kind of Mary thing. And um, yeah, he sees them there. And then he has to keep a secret what to himself until the next year. That was, that was very dramatic. In 1995, Audrey gets annoyed because she's missing out on some Mary things. There's a royal at County Hall doing. She's going to miss out on m meeting them. Yeah, it's going to be Betty. 
So in retaliation, she convinces Fred to go with her to a new leisure centre centre opening before Alf can get there and cut the ribbon in his place. And then Alf's like, oh, this is hassle. So he lets Audrey go to the do with Betty um, so instead of him. So it's just Betty, it, yeah. and, uh, Betty and Audrey go to this Meet royal, the, the royal reception instead of Alf. Mm-hmm. I guess does Alf go to the leisure centre with, <laughs> with Fred? Well, they do need it, to be fair. Um... His time as mayor nearly ends in scandal again. He's always in scandal. He's accused of embezzling money from the mayoral charity fund. But he that gets, sounds a bit Sally uh, Metcalf as well, doesn't yep, it? Yeah, gets exonerated when he finds out that it's actually Councillor Harry Potts who's also having an affair with the mayoral secretary. Mm. And I remember this too. I remember lots of people being sat down in chairs and being interviewed and to, yeah. to find out what was going on. Harry Potts had come into the show a few years earlier as the, the the lead caretaker at Weatherfield High and that was when Derek Wilton was taken on as the like underling there and um and Harry was just a really horrible boss to him but um they, they developed the character a bit by making him into a counsellor and yeah he, he just had a very scandalous end and he was like signing checks with a different name or whatever that was quite exciting yeah it was it, it was kind of exciting mm. um Alf gets given an OBE oh, that was pretty right. exciting and Audrey finds out about it she's like oh I've got a secret I've got a secret I'm not allowed to tell you I've, I've got I've something really exciting to happen but I'm not gonna keep I've she's got to keep, so not tell anybody that Alfie's got, a, that got the OBE so yeah she, you're fair play to her well done for keeping that secret but, but just not the fact that you got a secret yeah the day but when they go to get the OBE the whole thing goes wrong um, for Audrey, they missed their train because she was looking for her earrings. Then they have to go in Don's cab. Then they get into an argument with Don. Well, it's mostly Audrey getting in. Alf never didn't really like getting into arguments with people, he's, did he? He was very. He's a bit like, like you. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't want to engage. Conflict. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't stand up for what's right. <laughs> <laughs> so she's bickering is that what's on his election posters <laughs> I just keep my nose out <laughs> <laughs> vote for me do you know what quo. at this point of my life I think I would vote for somebody that I keep my nose out <laughs> I keep my hands clean that's so it let you get on with whatever do what you want <laughs> don't involve me um, so they, she argues with Don about how he treated Ivy and so he dumps her at a service station and she has to hitchhike to the palace. She's sitting in a, just just like she's sitting in a, sitting in a car in, in a van and there's like a big dog there next to her, isn't yeah. there? She finally gets to the palace. But it's too uh, late. Too late. She sees Alf receiving his award with Betty, who he had spotted in the crowd, um, who'd gone to support him, I guess. Mm. And so otherwise that's a bit of a coincidence. I and, think it was just a bit of a coincidence, Betty. Okay, being well they could have just written in that she did that. I can't remember. So um, she misses out and Betty's there again. Yeah, there's a, it's a really funny scene. Like she goes up to Buckingham Palace gates and there's a there's a, a, a an Eastern Asian tourist it's there. It's a Japanese she's, tourist. Was it Japanese? We, we she, spoke about him before. Because she she grabs guy... the binoculars from around his yeah. neck and nearly throttles him so she can look in and see Alfie getting his award. And the actor then... who played that character was basically the Japanese tourist in like all the TV shows. Oh, really? Well, he, he had lots of little roles. Factoid. Oh, okay. A factoid, me, the word factoid means... Fact that isn't real, not small fact. Fact then, uh, do they really? Yeah. That one okay, yeah. So that was funny, and then the episode kind of ends with them posing for a photo, and Audrey's got a panda eyes because of everything that she's been through. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I was thinking about the meaning of the word factoid when I was um, driving back from the allotment today. Well, I did think that that was a bit of an odd bit of trivia for you to have on the tip of well, your tongue. I just tongue, remembered to it earlier today. You've been to the allotment today. Yeah. Oh. Got water the plants. Okay. Good for you. 1996, the council offer to rename Mayfield Court. Now, this was the old people's home. <laughs> You've written the old people's home. She's like, come the on. The old people's home. Come on, lads. <laughs> come on, jump on. You're not too old for it. You don't have your she's menopause, to, do she's you? She's trying to save the council money by bumping the old men off. <laughs> the old people's home, Mayfield Court. This is where they used to send some of the old characters. Because like, yeah. I think Percy Sugden ended up at Mayfield Court. So did Maud Grimes. And um, the council says, right, let's rename it Alf- Alfred Roberts Court or something like that. The old age pensioners do not like this. This was the story that was supposed to be Phyllis Pierce uh, and... Um, Percy mm-hmm. versus them but uh, sadly Jill Summers um, got too sick or something around that time so they had to in- introduce this new character called Lily Dempsey I think who was another cantankerous old woman who was there outside the uh, the town hall steps with her the placards and everything and um, this was a, that was a 
a like, filming location that I visited the other year, wasn't it? Anyway, I digress. So the council say, right, the old the, the, the old aid pensioners don't like this. You can choose a road to rename instead after yourself. And he's like, well, obviously, Coronation Street. Let's make it Alfred Roberts Place or something. But he changes his mind when he hears that there are plans to demolish that street as well. So he says, well... That, uh, that never mind, um, I, I hear you residents, you don't like the idea that um, the road's going to be renamed after me. Um, probably too much faff to the programme, to be honest. So um, he picks another road. It would be a road. bit weird if the programme was just called Alf Roberts. Yeah, could you just imagine. It's, it's, <laughs> And he's not like even when, in it, and he hasn't been in it for 20 years. A bit like when Jenny and Johnny threatened to change the Rovers to Rovers with a Z on the end. Yeah, that but was But anyway, yeah, he, he makes out <laughs> that he's being considerate of his um, constituents' wishes when actually he secretly knows that the, route, the road is going to be demolished. But it isn't for whatever reason. So I must have asked this about a million times. Is there an Alf Roberts place somewhere in Weatherfield, or did it never happen? Yes, I believe there is. I think there is an Alf Roberts road or place or, or something somewhere or If other. you could pick... Um, Michael Dodson, and then you had to have a, a Ooh, name on the question. end. What would it be? Avenue, Court, Place? I don't want to think fancy, like Grove. Way. Michael Dodson, Grove sounds like where you get molested. <laughs> what? No, why does it? no, it doesn't. It does. Grove? <laughs> yeah, Grove does sound dodgy to me. I'm sorry, but it does. No. It sounds like shady little place where people hang what out. What would you choose? Grabsy then? people. What would you choose? <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like the idea of my name being used as a street name. Oh. I don't think it's a very nice name for naming Set me things. Up there, um, also that year, um, Alf gets chosen to head the Weatherfield Millennium celebrations, and this was great for the character. He was basically Weatherfield's Mister Millennium, wasn't he? And he was like, you know, working as a you know, a loyal servant of Weatherfield for many, many years. He was the face of the posters of the year two thousand, which the sadly child. he was the Never poster, the poster guy. He didn't make it to the Millennium, which is very, very sad. I don't think if you if you're a youngster, if you were sort of if you were younger than, say, 10 at the turn of the millennium, mm. I don't think you'd really get what a big deal it was. No. To, to you can imagine, or, yeah, you it can probably kind of was, imagine, wasn't it? But, but... Really, literally, my entire life, and I think for, for a good amount of chunk of time for lots of other people, we spent a lot of time fantasising about the year 2000 and what kind of things would How happen. How old were we, were and we what being? What would what it would be, be like? And, yeah. and, like, getting ready for the celebrations. Like, the fact that they started in, in 1996... When it happened, you know, it's four years mm. time. It was such a big deal. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, as I say, unfortunately, it didn't particularly pan out for this show. Um, Brian Molesley has more health problems again, and he's barely in Coronation Street in 1997 because um, because Brian's had another heart attack. But Brian Park, uh, the then producer, well, you know, the new one that came in mid 1997, goes to Brian Molesy and says, Hey, I know you're feeling a bit sick and everything, but come back to the show. It'll be great, I promise. And and uh, and, and Brian Molesy just decides to go along with it because he loves the show well, too. Well, he gives so him a reduced much. workload. He, he gets a reduced w- workload, yeah, but yeah, he just, he just loves being in the show. Um, and and he, we see a bit more of him in 1998. This is when the um, committee decide to build, build a Millennium Concert Bowl on the Red Wreck, which um, leads to Spider, Toya and Emily going on there to protest Them and climbing up the trees and everything. They also do a bit of a protest in Audrey and Elf's front garden, which is quite fun. Um, but then Elf disappears again for five months, mostly falls ill. His friends and family at this time were saying, Brian, you've got to quit. You're going into Coronation Street. It's making you sick. But he's like, no, I'm going to go back again. He said at the time, I can't remember, this was from a newspaper at the time. He said, I love Coronation Street. It's in my blood and gives me something to get up for. I'd become a vegetable if I stopped. I'll never quit. Um, and when he does come back later in the year, you can see that he's he's lost a lot of weight, hasn't he? Um, he's, he's a real shadow of his former self. As somebody who was, you know, such a... A, a, a large, portly, rotund, kind of jolly Father Christmas kind of guy without the beard. For all of his time on the show, really, it was really sad to see what um, how he, he spent his final months on the show. Molesley himself described himself as looking like, and I quote, something someone had dug up in those final oh. episodes. He he really looked, he really looked bad. I mean, he, was, right. he was slimmer, but it was, it was a real shame. But anyway, Alf himself leaves the council um, Audrey ends up taking the position uh, from him after beating Spider Nugent by only seven votes, um, and he also buys Audrey Fiona's salon. And then in 1999, 
the character dies at Nick's birthday party, 18th birthday party, just after midnight. And it turns out he hadn't renewed his life insurance policy and it leaves Audrey with almost no money, just the house and the salon. Yeah, just, it's just really sad. Just loads of property, but no cash. <laughs> it was really sad because like, it, was, it was just a final, you know, all, all, all of their married life, Alpha say, you can't have money, you can't have money. And um, this was the the final thing. She was like, it's just really typical that I've lost this all. But oh well, yeah, because she's, got, she's she's minted again now. So yeah, he so Things he died. He died like in nineteen ninety eight, really, didn't he? I can't. Th- there was lots of people trying to investigate, saying, "Did you see him after midnight?" Because the thing about this was the life insurance policy was renewed as soon as the clock struck midnight. Yeah, but it wasn't renewed. So I think that's that what he, I meant. Yeah, yeah he died in, in. He died just into nineteen ninety nine. So yeah. it hasn't ticked over. But anyway, that was the This end is why you do things Alf. by direct debit. Exactly. Well, I think Alf, um, Alf said that he never had like credit cards or anything like that. He didn't like the idea of o- owing anybody money. He wanted to be in charge of his finances. And I suppose the idea of direct debit, where someone else has taken the money for him, he, I don't know if they, he didn't want to go for it. I don't it. know when they invented direct debit. But anyway, David Hansen, who was the new producer by that point, had decided to axe Alf for the sake of the actor's health. Um, he ended up shooting his final um, scenes two months after being told he would be leaving, so it was a pretty quick turnaround from him. And looking back at some articles at the time, Brian Molesy was not happy with this decision. Uh, one quote I found, I mean, most of this was off Corypedia, I have to say, I've not mentioned Corypedia, but they've got an incredibly thorough um, page for, for Elf Roberts that I've kind of cherry-picked bits from here, but honestly, they've done an awesome job from him. But um, yeah, one of the things that, that Alf said was... Um, I thought I'd weathered the storm. To get rid of Alf now seems totally stupid. There's so much more for him to do. I had hoped to keep him going until at least 2000. I would have liked to see Alf as Weatherfield's Millennium Man. I've been here a long time and I thought they could have done that for me. And and it's really sad to hear that about these long long running characters because, I mean, you get the likes of, you know, Rita and Ken who are still here and you could never imagine any Cory producer axing them now, could you? Even if no. they were sick, I, I couldn't I think, imagine honestly, it. Honestly, I feel like I feel like they thought they were cutting him off or something that was da- damaging him. I think that I think they did, but yeah, Brian, really, really unhappy. He was all like, even his final scenes. He didn't like another quote I found was um saying filming that death scene was bloody boring because all I had to do was sit there and pretend to be dead. Sean Wilson, right. who yeah. plays my son-in-law Martin, had to shake me and say, oh no, he's gone, Audrey. In rehearsal, I leapt out of the chair and yelled, surprise! I couldn't resist it. Poor Sean nearly jumped out of his skin. <laughs> then two extras kept tripping over my feet and I had to say, oh, come on, I'm supposed to be dying here. It's I, it's just really sad to hear him. It's not criticising the show, is it? But he, it was, you know, his exit left him with a really bad taste in his mouth. Yeah, but... But, yeah, then it got worse because, you know, well, Brian Molesley himself died six weeks after Alf. So, you know, mid-February um, 1999, I remember seeing this in the paper at the time, or teletext or, you know, something like that, and utterly shocking. Um, he, yeah, he'd had heart another attack. heart attack, and, and so that was the end of him. And so, literally, finished Corey, and then, six you know, yeah, he, he filmed it six weeks after that so you know a couple of months after he filmed his final episodes he was gone um and hit but quite sweetly i think his trilby hat the character's trilby was placed on the coffin uh when he was buried that is kind of sweet it's kind of sweet isn't now, it now this this is in, like this is very dark speculation but it just made me wonder do the do the producers think oh we, d- we made the right choice he got to sort of relax in his last six weeks or was it a case of him raging and like working himself up to yeah. a heart attack because he thought that he, he was, no, yeah, would he have lived longer know. if he had been in the show? I don't it's know. It's really dark to speculate about that. I know it's very it's... dark, but it, my mind is a dark place. So I thought I'd open it up <laughs> to let some light in. And unfortunately I just let the, this bad things out. I don't um, know. But um, yeah, because cause stress can trigger things, but yeah. I don't, I, I, I think that they he'd made been the an right decision, unwell really. Man. I think they did at the end of the day. He'd, be, he'd been very unwell for a good you, few years at that point. It would be irresponsible yeah, yeah. To, to make this man... Yeah, your employee, however beloved yeah, got, you are. And Alf was a very, very a duty of loved character. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I found a couple of other quotes just to read out. Um, I keep saying I found it. They were there right in front of me on Corypedia. Mosley in 1990 said, um, I don't go along with Elf about a lot of things. I don't spend time in pubs. It's a tremendous waste of time. <laughs> he has a very limited outlook on travel and has never seen to read. I'm sure he does. He probably reads Tolstoy. And it's never <laughs> been shown. I've got my own secret world of Elf that I work from. Which That's is, really which is funny. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny how he's got like a fondness for the character, but he didn't really like him. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it kind of some some actors and characters you can't really separate, especially back in the olden days. And I've got no idea what the actors were were really like if they kept themselves to themselves. But it is funny when you hear things like that that they're completely opposite to their characters. And uh, I've got a really nice uh, final quote here from Sue Nichols obviously plays Audrey um, in 2010 she said of him um, I'll say until my dying day that lovely Brian didn't get the acting plaudits or, and the kudos he deserved Alf may not have been the most showy character but he was an ordinary man and it's very difficult to play ordinary any of us with due respect can play over the top do a funny walk or pull a silly face but it's very difficult to play ordinary because people don't think you're acting Brian came into that category because he remained so wonderfully true to the character he played. And it's, it's, That's great. It what is. Great he, he really was a great ordinary character, wasn't he? He's, he's a bit like, you know, Harry Hewitt back in the day as well. And I want to make a di- a d- um, distinction here between ordinary and boring. Yeah. Because I think that lo- it's very easy to play a boring character or be a boring... Yeah, because that is a, that's a personality trait, but isn't it? But being somebody ordinary who, who is also likeable and charismatic. Yeah, yeah, because there's I'm sure, again, lots of people could name characters in Coronation Street now where you, you say, well, I can't really describe their personality. They're just, you know, just they're, just, they're just normal and I don't really like them. But Alf, Alf did it uh, really, really, really well. And well, um, I yeah. think being part of that double act with Audrey was um, very, very helpful for his character. Yeah. Uh, just before we finish, I have um, been having a little look through my 1990s Coronation Street magazines just official to try and Coronation uh, Street magazine. official yeah just to yeah. try and get something that wasn't from the Corypedia and uh, in episode 12 he was uh, there's some pictures of it's him it's not called in, episode oh, issue 12 sorry. I'm in the biz I can tell um, you thank you there was uh, pictures of him <laughs> there in his full on like cavalier of fencing regalia and um, he's talking about his um, Empire Games standard fencing, which started when he was in the RAF and he just carried it on. He said, um, well, I've, I've said this already, he, he talks about arranging them, the fights on stage. How he worked it, with Neil Diamond yeah, before he, did he was with Neil, famous. Yeah, Neil Diamond, yeah. He said, well, not, not to do a fight, but to be in a photo shoot to make him look like a fencer. <laughs> um, and, and he said, fencing is a very interesting sport. If you have good reflexes and work hard, then you can become competent quite quickly. You're always learning as you come up against different opponents' strengths and techniques, and the skill lies in judging what they are doing and how to counter it. So I don't know if there's any, any listeners here that want to go into fencing based on uh, Brian Mulsey's recommendations. Do let us well, know. It, it goes. It doesn't. It feel a bit sympathetic to what an actor is because an actor has to play off of their opponents in a, in a scene. They they kind of thrive off of mm. um, what what the person what their partner's giving them. Yeah, very very true. Mm. Um, and then apparently, when this interview was done, and this must have been the early nineties, he was still a like a fencing instructor then. Like you know, in the spare time, he taught p- other people how to fence. That's that's really you cool. It's like you can't imagine that of <laughs> Alf Roberts no. at all, can you? No. Um, in issue twenty of the magazine, he he showed another little hobby of his, which is model making. So he <laughs> one of the things that he had was a model eighteenth century gun, which apparently nice. he assembled out of various pieces given to him by a props man. Don't tell Roy. Um, and he, he had some toy soldiers and stuff as well. And apparently his wife Norma made porcelain cats filled with sand, which she tells <laughs> for charity. They were quite nice, actually. It's the sort of thing where you go in the charity shop now and it's like, why, who, yeah. where did this apparently come from? Apparently they were supposed to be made as like um, door stops, but people used to buy them and put them on the mantelpiece and stops. stuff. Yeah. Um, Brian in that interview also talked about um, doing charity stage shows as well. So again, when he wasn't in Coronation Street, he used to go around the country a little bit, um, including sharing a stage at the London Palladium with the likes of Cliff Richard. Who's still going. Still going strong today, this old Cliff. Yeah. Um, and then finally, in issue 38 of the magazine, there was a and a with him and a um, few quotes and, and facts there. I was going to say factoids, but I stopped myself. Mm-hmm. He said, Alf is everything that I'm not. He's a shopkeeper. He can deal with VAT. He's a counsellor. And he goes into the same pub night after night. I do none of these things. And in fact, I thoroughly dislike all the things that Alf does, apart from being married to Audrey. He really hated this character, didn't he? I don't know that he... I don't know. I don't know. 
I'm sure he had some fondness for him. It seems like him. he th- thought that he just, Alf lived in a very small world. Yeah, he just wanted to make it really clear that he, he Brian, is very different I hate to pubs. Alf. Yeah. Um, he said he could never put up with a wife like Audrey in real life. He says she, he's such an indulgent husband that if she didn't buy herself an emerald ring, then he probably would. And then he'd say that they couldn't really afford it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that really funny. Um, he said if he could have been any other Corrie character, he'd have been Stan Ogden. Nice. Um, he doesn't think that Elf will ever be... I see, I've written down here in my notes that Elf will ever be sit. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking... Oh, knighted. Sir. He doesn't think that Elf is ever going to be made a sir, but he does admit at least he's got as good a chance of, as anyone else, I suppose. Well, he was on a, he was on a stage with Sir Cliff Richard. He was, yeah. I think that's how they give them out, isn't it? Proximity. <laughs> sir by proxy. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's got friends who are masons. Interesting fact. And he they, they keep inviting him to join up. But he says, I don't like the idea of swearing oaths and stuff. Right. So that was when somebody was asking him, you know, he was in the Square Dealers, which is like the Weatherfield equivalent of the yeah, Masons. And they're like saying, that, would you do it? this? And he's like, no. Nope. Um, and he unwinds after a hard day of currying by going home to his family. And apparently he has quite a large uh, family because when they have Sunday lunch together, there are 18 of them sitting around the table. That sounds like bliss. Yeah, so I hope they all, uh, they, they have to do an awful lot of roast, uh, roast potatoes for that. Oh, and that's probably about as many as I cook normally. <laughs> it probably is, isn't it? <laughs> Gemma does like to I go like overboard to cook. with the old roasties. It's I don't good. like the idea of not having enough roast potatoes. Mm, that's mm. the worst thing. Yeah. And that is it for Alf. So, um, Gemma, final impressions of Alf. Now you have got an opportunity to, to revisit oh some of his moments visually. I just thought, he just feels like one of these gentle giants, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, he was, yeah, just a very constant presence. I know that the joke is that, you know, that Ken's the eternal mm. c- Corey character, but, you know, in, in a sense, Alf felt that way yeah. for quite a lot of the time that Corey was on. Yeah, and, and didn't necessarily, necessarily get involved in the yeah. most exciting of storylines really either. Not a background character, but just more like a piece of furniture <laughs> mm. in, a, in the nicest possible way. Yeah, so yes. Like a part of the, the fabric the, of society. Important of, of job of the shopkeeper, you yeah. know, standing at the bar at the Rovers. He could be very pompous. He could be, um, you yeah, know, very skin flinty. Um, I like that. But he was he Him was lovable. Too. Yeah, yeah. He was a, he was a he was a really nice guy. A very very important character to Coronation Street's history, and it's been lovely being able to revisit his past today. And um, if 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 like Jeremy, you haven't seen many of the early episodes with Alfin, then I I do urge you to go and have a look. Yeah, go and, watch and him and drinking out, beer in thirty six thrilling episodes. Yeah, look out for the hat. Mm. Bowl, bowl, bowl hat or trilby. Yeah, that's how that's how you can, you can time, tell he becomes like a phoenix. It. Yeah. yeah. Right. I think we will end it there because that was quite a long character profile. I thought it would be hour, over an hour and a half worth of Alf, but um, I'm, I'm a bit bereft now. We've actually done the Alf character I profile. To live for. I don't have anything to live for. I've got other ideas, obviously, of things that we need to do for the podcast, but it's been so, so, so long that in the back of my head I've been thinking we really must get around to doing Alf well, one of these days. Well, he's been dead for like 23 years. Yeah. You could have done it between then and now. Well, I don't point. think the podcast been going that long, but um, anyway, I, I hope it's um, it's lived up to it. I'm, I'm sure that in many ways it hasn't, but um, there you go. You can, if, it's done now. It's done. It's done. It's over with, and we are not doing him again. And I don't think he's going to be back anytime soon to uh, do any extra stories. Audrey, Audrey has a fever dream. Yes, yeah. It's nice that Audrey's still in it because he does get the odd mention every now and then, doesn't I he? Love I, I just love how she calls him Alfie. I know. It's just, that, that little turn of affection Aww. is uh, is just lovely. Yeah. Aww. Okay, with that, we will leave it there. We will come back with this week's main podcast later on in the week to see what we thought about this week's Coronation Street. If you have other memories of Alf that you'd like to share, do write in, let us know. We like to hear about that sort of thing. Um, but if not, uh, don't. Yeah, don't. Don't if you don't want to. Um, but you can do things do like following us on Twitter and YouTube and Patreon and, and, and all of that. Definitely Join our if... Coronation Street community. Oh, yeah, we've Twitter. got one on Twitter now, haven't we? A newfangled thing. I'm sure it's going to... Take off. Set the internet alight. 45 Again, people. If you are listening to this on YouTube and you're staying to the bitter end, I would urge you to like and subscribe because <laughs> it's... it's, it's really, Please really click jolly that. lovely if do you, you click did. the bell? Yes, yeah, ding the bell. bell. That's 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 subscribe. What we actually would really really like you to subscribe because we're aiming for a thousand, thousand subscribers because yeah. that would be nice. Yes, thank you. Tell very your much. friends. Bring a friend and a relative. They can mute us if they like. Right, we're going. Goodbye, yeah. everybody. Bye. See you.